Let's check out some cowboys. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah from Everyday Starlet. Welcome to my channel. I make videos to inspire you to be the star of your own life. I'm continuing my Masculine Feminine Energies film breakdown series with a TV series, Yellowstone. If you're not familiar with what I mean by Masculine Feminine Energies, I have a ton of videos on this content. It goes into much more detail. But a brief summary, Masculine and Feminine Energies are energies that live within all of us. We all contain both energies. We all have a core energy that's when we're most ourselves in. That core energy may link up with our gender. It doesn't have to, but it very often does. We can be in wounded or healed versions of either of these energies. Energies, and each of these energies contains archetypes. We all embody all of the archetypes and we can tap into any of them whenever we need to. I have lots of videos about the masculine and the feminine archetypes. You can check those out. And in order to have sexual polarity in a relationship, you need one partner to be in the masculine and one partner to be in the feminine. These opposite energies attract sexually and same energies repel sexually. So let's look at Yellowstone. This was actually a request from my good friend Kayla from Flex Your Feminine. I'm going to leave her Instagram below. I highly recommend you check her out. She's an expert at combining fitness and feminine energy and helping you work out to support your feminine hormones. So definitely check her out. We actually did an Instagram live a while back. I'll link that below too. So I'll link that below too so you can check that out. We talked about a lot of great juicy stuff great like sisterhood moment. So this breakdown might be a little bit different than some of my other breakdowns that are more films because for one thing this is a TV series so it is a long show. There's a lot of content so I'm only going to be able to give you some of the highlights. I also want to note that I watched the first four seasons of the show. As of filming this season five has not been released yet. I do believe it's coming out soon but it hasn't been released yet so this breakdown is only of the first four seasons of the show. Since most of my breakdowns are actually of movies so it's pretty easy for somebody to actually sit down and watch a movie after they watch my breakdown. If you haven't already seen Yellowstone, if you're not intending to watch it, you can still get some great stuff from this video. I'm sure there'll be some great juicy lessons and tidbits and I'll try to be as detailed as possible talking about some of these scenes and talking about some of the characters so I'm sure you'll get a lot out of this video. If you have watched Yellowstone, you probably will know what I'm talking about in this. If you are planning on watching it or you are currently watching it, I'm sure I'm going to give away some spoilers so I'll just give you a spoiler alert now. I also don't know how many actual film scenes I'll be able to take and do breakdowns of like I usually do on my TikTok and in YouTube shorts. Because this is a newer show, the full scenes are not really readily available online for me to get really good quality content. Partly because of copyright things and also because this show is pretty graphic and some of the things that I'm going to talk about actually involve scenes where there's some violence, some sexual stuff and... I already have a lot of warnings on social media for things that are not really that violent or that graphic and so I don't know how many scenes I'm going to be able to actually do individual breakdowns of. But I'll try to set up some of the scenes and some of the energies and things that I'm talking about so that even if you haven't seen the show or you don't know what specific scene I'm talking about, you'll probably be able to follow along with the energies and learn some really great lessons. Hopefully this video will be helpful. I'm going to do my best. So I'm going to start with a smaller storyline that's actually not really a hugely significant part of the actual show, but I do think this is a really great example of masculine and feminine energies. And that is the relationship between Teeter and Colby. Teeter is a female ranch hand. She is very tough. She's very rough and tumble. She's very masculine in her demeanor. She's a really thick Texas accent. It's actually really hard for most people to understand her. She's very aggressive. She's very powerful. And she is actually, I would say she's in a very wounded masculine energy of being very aggressive and controlling the way she hits on Colby. It's uncomfortable to watch the way she aggressively hits on him. Colby gets very awkward. Now, I mean, he's a manly guy, but he is very much like in a wounded feminine because it's, it's that polarity. So because she's so aggressive, he almost acts like he's being victimized by her come-ons. Now, I want to state that if this dynamic was switched and there was a man who was being that masculine and aggressive hitting on a female, especially in an employee setting, that would be sexual harassment for sure. So I'm not justifying the way that Teeter is talking to him because in a workspace situation, I do think it's inappropriate. I think some of it might be her way of trying to act like one of the guys, so to speak. And so they have this kind of awkwardness. There's a moment, and I know I can't use this scene even if I could find it online because it's quite graphic, but there's a point where Teeter and Colby actually get jumped while they're working and they're basically left for dead. And Teeter is actually beat up a lot rougher than Colby was. And Colby actually essentially kind of 
comes to and tries to rescue Teeter because she's about to drown and like they're both like really beat up but Teeter got it way worse. In that moment, Teeter was so vulnerable. I mean, she was barely surviving and Colby was trying to save her life. She's so soft and vulnerable and that's the moment that they kiss because that's the moment that he becomes attracted to her because they've now shifted. She's this vulnerable feminine woman and he is this masculine man who's trying to protect her and, and, and rescue her. And I know that the whole like the sort of victim rescue mentality can can get toxic but it really does kind of go to the root of the idea of the feminine being vulnerable and the masculine essentially wanting to protect and teeter even kind of makes a joke about like something about like oh now that my face has been rearranged like now's the time you want to kiss me like it's kind of like this like playful moment but they've now shifted energies because she's vulnerable. Now this is an extreme situation. I'm not at all saying that a woman needs to be like beaten and left for dead in order for her to be open and vulnerable to masculine protection. Like this is in the extreme. However, Teeter was a very, very much in this, this wall up masculine type of demeanor. Something this extreme may have been the only thing that might have actually softened her. Who knows? Not a justification for violence at and it's not like Colby was the one that hurt her. He was also being attacked. It's just that she got attacked more severely than he did. So he managed to be able to come to and he managed to come to her rescue. It's an extreme case, but it's a sign of the fact that when two people are kind of in their wounded energies, which is usually a sign that they're not in their natural core energy, they come together in the sense that she's kind of drawn to him and like drawn to coming on to him when she's in this wounded masculine and he kind of sinks into this wounded feminine. But when they actually shift so that she's fully in her feminine and she didn't need to get beaten up in order for that to happen she could choose to do that and to work on that herself like if we're talking about a woman in regular life she could work on that herself to learn to be open and soft and vulnerable in order to allow for masculine protection to come in that said it's that moment where they shift and she is open and vulnerable and he is he is stepping into his masculine to protect her the, the, that's the moment that they kind of they come together sexually and they have a kiss I not really imply that anything else happens and they do end up I'm pretty sure in like a future scene they kind of shift back into that old pattern that they had again this is an extreme example if you get into this sort of like the woman and her wounded masculine the man and his wounded feminine so you have this sort of like aggressor and victim kind of relationship dynamic which is actually very common in the modern day nagging controlling wife and like weak passive husband like that dynamic super common you can shift instantly like you can shift into your core energies instantly and that's when you become sexually polarized however it's really easy to shift back if you haven't actually done the healing work in order to to really know how to naturally sink into your core energies. A man may be able to step up and be in his masculine and go into his protector mode if need be, but if he hasn't healed the part of him that like wasn't keeping him in his masculine energy most of the time, he's probably gonna sink back into that weak passive mode. Whereas if a woman, does end up in this sort of like nagging, controlling masculine energy, like wounded masculine energy. And then she can step into a moment of vulnerability. But if she hasn't healed the part of her that needed to be the controlling wounded masculine, she's very easily going to shift back in. So like these energies can shift very quickly and you can actually polarize together in a, in a sexual connection very quickly. However, if you don't heal the parts of you that kind of got you out of your natural core energy, or into your wounding in the first place, you're probably gonna sink back into those patterns until you actually work on healing so you actually can tap into your healthy version of your natural core energy. And you can also have a healthy connection to your opposite energy. I mean, ideally, you wanna have a really healthy connection to your natural core energy and be in that energy most of the time, but also have access to a healthy version of the opposite energy that you can tap into when needed. That's kind of like the ideal situation. It's when either of these energies start to become wounded or you start to spend too much time outside of your natural core energy, that's usually when problems start and when you've got couples that are coming together because of those those shifts and wounding and things like that that's usually when you start to have problems so let's talk about jimmy jimmy is an interesting character because this show actually really is jimmy's like coming of age it's really his transformation from boyhood to manhood now he is an adult when the show starts he's quite young but he's an adult however he's still very much in boyhood he really has not had 
a solid representation of what it means to grow up to be a man. And he ends up getting this opportunity to come and be a ranch hand at Yellowstone. And he really has no clue about anything having to do with cowboys or ranches or anything. It's completely outside his own like realm of thinking. He's actually been getting in a lot of trouble. He was involved with drugs and crime and things like that. He kind of had gone off the, the path to where he should be going. And this ranch was really his opportunity to really get his life together. And the first four seasons, at least, of the show were really... Jimmy's coming of age. It's like the training ground for him becoming the man that he has the potential to be. And he takes a lot of twists and turns along the way. I've mentioned this in a few other videos, especially in my 300 breakdown, that many cultures believe that you know men need to be initiated into their masculine energy. They don't naturally evolve. Women naturally evolve into their feminine energy, provided they don't have outside intervention with the way society is going right now. If women were left to just naturally evolve, we nature would, would bring us into womanhood. That's the women have a much deeper connection with nature. Whereas men need masculine leaders in order to guide them into their masculinity. And it usually was not just the father figure, although the father figure is important, but it was usually the elders, the masculine elders in a community. And that's really what Yellowstone was for Jimmy. Like they were the masculine elders that were guiding him into his masculinity. He had a rough go at it because again, he started from nothing. He knew nothing about anything, even how to ride a horse or anything like that. And they really put him through a lot of really rigorous tests. Many people could argue that one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of boys who are transitioning into manhood in our current society, and we have a lot of man children in our world today is that there really aren't initiation processes in our current society to guide men into masculinity but that's really what's going on with jimmy and some of them are pretty ugly and some of them are pretty rough but they're actually teaching him his full potential it's kind of like you know that they're they're teaching him how to grow up and to step into his full masculine. He has a few twists and turns along the way. Jimmy actually finds out he's really good at one of the events in the rodeo, except that it's a really dangerous event. He gets caught up in the glory of it because he's so good at it. The other men around him, some of them are kind of egging him on, some of them are kind of like, hey, this is dangerous, you're not gonna have a long career at this, you know, you could get killed, you could get, you know, paralyzed. I mean, there's all these different aspects to it and they don't want him to go for the fame and the glory and the quick buck. They want him to be able to have like a long sustaining career. You could very easily parallel that story to these young boys who get into sports and they think that sports is like their only way into success, money, fame. So they get all caught up in, I mean, in some cases actually destroying their bodies on this one shot of like possibly getting fame and quick money and all this like glamorous lifestyle. The playboy kind of aspects of things, you know, the Andrew Tates that lure men into this kind of world of, of glamor and fame and stuff. When you have these masculine elders who are basically like, no, you wanna be able to have like a sustainable career, something you can do for the rest of your life, something that's actually a skill, like a greater purpose in the world. And, and that's what they're kind of trying to encourage him to do is to not go for quick fame. Now Jimmy gets involved with Mia initially. Oh, I, I feel for Mia, I really do. Mia does a lot of things wrong and their relationship really is doomed, but I do feel for her, I really do. Mia is a barrel girl, which they keep referring to as basically being like the crazy girls in the rodeo. And so she's kind of, you know, she has a skill, she has a talent, she's part of the rodeo, she's been touring in the rodeo, so she's a little bit more like been there, done that. She's a lot more sexual experience than Jimmy does. She she takes his virginity in a very awkward way, which I won't get into in here, but it's, it's, it's weird. Mia is really pursuing him. Jimmy's kind of this up and coming guy in the rodeo and, and Mia kind of sees that he's attracted to her and she really kind of like latches on and, and pursues him. She kind of essentially moves into his bunkhouse and is really always around him. Like she's really kind of chasing him. Jimmy enjoys it because he likes the attention. He hasn't really had attention from women his whole life. He is enamored with her because she is she's beautiful and she's fun and she's exciting. And Jimmy's kind of going along with it. Jimmy really hasn't found himself yet. He's still lost. So as much as he's committed to her because she's there and she's been easy for him to get to because she's made things so easy for him. He's not committed to her because he truly loves her because he hasn't really even learned how to love himself yet. He hasn't found himself yet. He hasn't found his passion and purpose. He's still kind of lost. He ends up getting injured essentially because 
he finds Mia distracting. He gets injured the first time. Mia's there for him. He gets back. He gets better. And Mia's like pushing him to go back to the rodeo. He's made a promise that he won't go back to the rodeo again to his boss and to other people. Mia's really pushing him. So Mia sees the potential in Jimmy, which I think comes from a good place, but she sees it her way. She sees Jimmy's potential as being a big rodeo star, which he has the potential to be. I mean, clearly based on you know, how good he is at doing this. However, it's really risky. And there is a sense that Mia does care about Jimmy, but she needs Jimmy to be the man that she wants him to be in order for her to really love him. Like she she sees the potential in him, which is so common for the feminine. We, we see the potential in a man. Sometimes we get caught up in the potential that we want him to be as opposed to the potential that he actually is. And I think Jimmy is still figuring that out for himself. And because he hasn't really figured that out for himself, he's not gonna be able to actually commit to a partner because he doesn't really know what he's committing to and the masculine will always pick a feminine partner who is most in alignment with his true passion and purpose so if he hasn't found his passion and purpose yet he's not going to be able to settle down with with anyone because he doesn't really know what's going to fit him the best because he hasn't found that yet so mia really does encourage jimmy which i do think is coming from a good place like she is she has good intentions it's just not the best thing for her to be doing is she really pushes Jimmy to kind of like get back up on the horse and to try to try to reclaim his rodeo career. Jimmy gets injured again, badly injured again. He ends up having to go through all this physical therapy, learning to walk again, and Mia is there for him every step of the way. She absolutely is. Like she is with him at all of his appointments. She's helping him learn to walk again. She's she's there for him. Like she's devoted. Problem is she hasn't paid attention to how much Jimmy is devoted to her. He's there for her because he doesn't really have any other place to be. I actually remember, oh my god, I had this friend, this oh this poor girl was dating this guy who was awful to her. So awful to her. And he kept cheating on her. Like he was cheating on her all the time. I know I laugh at this. It's not funny, but like at a certain point it was just like it was comical how obvious it was that he was cheating on her and it was like no matter how many times you told her like the evidence is here like he's cheating and she would always be like he always comes home to me and I'm like that's because you both are living at his mom's house like that's not a like not a flex right with Mia it I mean Jimmy's not really running around he can't run anywhere he can't even walk but Mia is basically putting herself where Jimmy is and then it's like okay well we're together now and Jimmy's heart isn't really fully in it Mia's fully in it, but she's fully in the potential of who she thinks Jimmy can be in her mind. But she's not really aligned with Jimmy if Jimmy decides to go a different way or if that's not Jimmy's path. I've been a Mia in my youth, so I feel for her. <laughs> I really do. Jimmy essentially gets transferred to another ranch in Texas and Mia doesn't want him to go and Jimmy's basically like, I have to, I don't have a choice. And he makes a comment about no one ever really loving him or or something along those lines. And Mia's just like, after everything I did for you, like after all the things I've done for you, and you don't even think that I love you, like all these things, like Mia was doing so much. And oh my God, how many of us women have been in this situation where we've done so much for a man, but we weren't really paying attention to the fact that he was taking because we were giving, but he wasn't really invested in us, right? Like he wasn't really choosing us. We were choosing him over and over again and doing all these things for him. And it's that moment that, well, nobody's, nobody's ever really loved me. And she's like, well, who am I? Am I nobody? Like it's that kind of dynamic. And oh, my heart breaks for her. It really does. Because I really do think that Mia thought she was investing in a man who had potential. She saw his potential. I think she really was coming from what she believes was a genuine place, but it really was just so much wounding. She put all of her touring, all of her rodeo stuff, her whole life on hold just to be there for Jimmy and she put her all into Jimmy and it breaks my heart that it didn't work out. I just wanna like hug Mia and be like, girl, I've been there, please don't do that again. Or while she was doing it, I just wanted to like hug her and be like, please girl, like let's not do this. Like I just, oh my heart, my heart goes out to her, it really does. So Jimmy goes off to this other ranch in Texas and he becomes a man. Like he really steps into his manhood. Like you can see it in his demeanor and he really decides he's gonna be a cowboy. He's gonna learn how to be a cowboy and he's gonna really dedicate his life to this. He's now found his true passion and purpose. He ends up finding somebody else at the ranch and decides to get engaged. Now in that situation, that's Emily. I would say she's still the more aggressive one 
in the relationship like she's still pursuing him he still doesn't really know how to step up and like pursue a woman although he's really only ever dated Mia I don't really know and I don't know where they're gonna take their relationship or where it's gonna go in the future the fact that Jimmy has more of a sense of his true passion and purpose and now he's decided to devote himself to a woman who seems like she's in support of that like the difference really is that Mia was in in love with Jimmy's potential for who she had envisioned him to be whereas Emily was falling for Jimmy's potential in kind of the path that he was going on that was his choice and that's the real difference. I do still think that Jimmy really wasn't stepping up and like taking the lead as a man as a masculine partner so I don't really know where his relationship is going to go in the future. I don't really know the deal is going to be with Mia or anything as far as where the show is going to go but the Jimmy and Mia thing was kind of was doomed from the beginning. Jimmy and Emily um, I don't know. The way that it started out like it's obviously a healthier relationship whether or not it's really going to be able to stand the test of time. Who who knows I would still be a little leery because Jimmy's still kind of figuring himself out but he is in a better position to pick a partner with where he was at the end of the series or at the end of the season four than he was early on like he's definitely transitioned into much more of his masculine energy and having much more of a passion and purpose so like this whole show really was this massive like coming of age story for Jimmy Casey and Monica Casey and Monica's relationship goes through so many twists and turns. They, they shift energies and they both shift as people, as characters, so much throughout the series. It's kind of like you never know whether they're coming or going, whether they're together, whether they're not together. They obviously have a deep connection to each other. They just, they go through a lot. But you know what? In relationships and marriages, couples are going to go through a lot. In the very beginning of the series, there definitely is like an off polarity there. They, they seem as if they're happy. They're essentially living in a trailer with a lot of other people they're on the Indian reservation because that's where Monica's family is and Casey's kind of like rejected his family wants nothing to do with his family he's been in the military he's back from the military he's really trying to find himself you get the impression that he really felt like when he was in the military that he was doing something that he was really good at like that was sort of his passion and purpose at the time but now that he's not in the military and he's actually home with his family he's really lost like he's he's getting into horse training but he doesn't really have a passion and purpose of direction and Monica is a school teacher and she is essentially the one making all the money they actually have this scene too where Monica makes a comment about a new appliance I forget what it is something for their kitchen and Casey makes some comment about like is she gonna ask him for permission to buy it or like that she was gonna like seduce him to get permission she was like I make the money like I'm just asking you to go pick it up for me like I get it because she is making the money that's a sign of resentment right it is subtle emasculation however <laughs> the truth right I mean she's making the money and he's not it's a sign that she's got some bitterness about that 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 dynamic with her being the one to make the money and they're obviously not in a great financial situation they have a son they're just scraping by there's a subtle resentment there Casey's feeling really lost and when the masculine does not have a defined passion and purpose like he doesn't have a reason to get up in the morning he doesn't have a direction it doesn't necessarily always have to be a job so to speak Although ideally being able to provide for your family is going to be a very big masculine drive, but he has to have some kind of purpose in life, some kind of thing that he's passionate about that he feels like is his reason for being there. Casey's lost and doesn't really have that. So he makes a call to try to get back into the military and Monica finds out and she gets really upset because she wants Casey with her. But she also wants him to be making money. Unfortunately, his way of making money, or at least the way he thinks he needs to make money, is gonna take him away from the family so there's this battle there with like she's like I want you here but she's also resenting him a little bit because she's the one having to make the money Tom and Giselle okay anyway I'm gonna do a whole video where I'm gonna talk about the two of them that's a whole separate subject but anyway that's a big conflict I think for the feminine because the feminine is always gonna long for more of, of the masculine for more of everything really but the masculine is going to need a passion and purpose. And in reality, as feminine women, we really want our masculine partner to have a passion and purpose. He's just going to be a better overall human, you know, husband, father, partner, man in general, if he has that passion and purpose. But that passion and purpose is very likely going to take him away from us, sometimes more than others. And 
that's a big it's an inner conflict with the feminine like she's never really going to fully be able to have exactly what she wants because she wants her masculine partner to have his passion and purpose but she also longs for him to be with her so that inner conflict that monica's going through especially in the beginning very normal however it is a problem because Casey's really feeling lost. He doesn't really know, he's not really stepping into his true manhood because, and really as a husband and father, because he just doesn't know what to do. They go through a lot of conflict. There's like an odd storyline where Monica essentially gets a, a pretty massive head injury and she feels like she needs to like leave Casey for a while and they go through this back and forth. At one point, they actually end up going and staying on the Yellowstone Ranch, which is really where Casey's father wants him to be. Uh, he wants Monica and their son Tate to be there. Like he wants the family to be there. Monica's got a lot of conflict because she's got some issues between her Native American ancestry and her resentment towards the ranch. So she's got this inner conflict. I do think though, when they actually kind of move on to the ranch, Monica really gets to be in nature more. She gets to see her son in nature more. She sees her husband starting to thrive in in a place where he's just really himself. He's comfortable. He enjoys doing the ranching and stuff. Like she's seeing her husband thrive. She's seeing her son thrive. Especially when they, they go off and they're on like these campsites at one point. Monica and Casey are so tuned into each other because they're tuned into nature. They both have a really strong connection to nature. And Casey especially too has this connection with wolves and, and Monica really does soften a lot in, in that time. Like she really does soften. And I will say as much as she's kind of, even when she's in conflict about whether she can stay with Casey or not, Casey is always so devoted to, to her and to his son. Like there's an incredible devotion that he has to his family, which is very noble. They have this really great polarity. Monica gets this opportunity where she gets to teach at a university, which she really does feel like that's like her passion and purpose. She also gets to have this wonderful life with her family, but she's still very conflicted because she has a lot of distrust about Casey's family. Their son ends up getting kidnapped. It's a whole lot of drama and Monica really does feel like she can't be on the ranch anymore. The feminine is really indecisive. Let's be serious. Her feelings and her emotions and things are valid. However, if the masculine lets the feminine feelings and emotions control him, he's gonna go off track. That's not to say that the masculine needs to control the feminine's emotions. The feminine needs to be able to have her emotions, to have her feelings, to let them free. The masculine needs to know how to be able to work with the feminine emotions and not let them control him. There's an interesting scene actually when Monica and Casey kind of have their first breakup and then Casey comes back and is basically telling Monica that he he doesn't know how not to be with her. Like she's, you know, she's the love of his life. She's his best friend. Like he doesn't know how to have life without her. And she admits the same. He keeps saying, well, you told me to do this, so I did this, you told me to do that. And she's like, I wanted you to make a decision. Like that's, that's one of the big conflicts that happens in so many relationships is the feminine will say, I want you to do this, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I wanna do this. It's not that those things are invalid. However, the feminine usually says what she's feeling in that moment and she may feel something different in the next moment. The feminine's feelings and emotions are always changing. If the masculine is unable to make a decision and have a direction and a path, and he lets the feminine feelings and emotions sort of distract him from that, it's usually a recipe for disaster because he's not gonna feel stable. So if he's just literally doing everything that a woman tells him to do, he's not gonna feel like a grounded masculine presence. Now her feelings should be taken into consideration. And this gets into the feminine being more of the oracle, which I can get into in a further video because I think that gets into a lot more depth of a lot of different aspects of things. So I'm not saying that the masculine should ignore what a woman is thinking or what she's feeling or anything like that. But if he's letting her feelings, emotions, what she's saying in that moment, what she's saying in the heat of, of you know, anger or the heat of her feelings and emotions, if he starts letting that direct him as opposed to him having a direction and then using her responsiveness or using her feminine intuition as a way of helping him make his next direction or make his next move. I can actually go into a much deeper video on the feminine oracle and the masculine direction because I think that would be a really great video. So I'm not gonna dive into that too much because I'm sure this video is already gonna be pretty long. Casey hasn't always felt stable when he just goes along with, and that's part of the problem is because Monica has a lot of masculine energy within her, but she also has a lot of feminine energy. 
and Casey does too, but Casey is really a masculine chord being. So when Monica gets so much in her masculine and Casey starts getting into that wobbly, flowy feminine, they, they're off. They're unstable. And there's definitely several situations where Monica gets very traumatized. She gets injured or she, you know, her son is in danger or different things that, that actually hurt Monica directly because of the instability of Casey's family. That Monica's really starting to build up some resentment and, and there's that inner conflict there. So Monica, so Monica and Casey throughout the series really do have a lot of shifts. Monica will go into her masculine and Casey will kind of get into that wobbly feminine. Whereas when Casey gets into that masculine direction, Monica can kind of sink into that feminine energy. However, when things get really unsafe, Monica panics and she goes into her masculine again. So I actually do think that Monica and Casey could come together and have a really good relationship. The problem that arises is the fact that they never really feel like they can be in their own natural core energies for a long period of time. Monica is really kind of fighting, sinking into her feminine. She's still kind of trying to be in that masculine because at times she's had to be in her masculine because Casey hasn't stepped up to that. So she doesn't fully trust him or fully trust the universe, the situation, or you know, the people around her because she's been hurt so many times. So so Monica is struggling with that. Casey really needs to find his direction, his passion and purpose on his own. When he finds that he's gonna be repelled if Monica can't sink into that, that relaxed feminine energy. When Casey does step into that and Monica does relax into her feminine, they, they're they together like, I mean, they've got a lot of passion and a lot of heat. It's when they shift, that's where they get into the problem. Very common in relationships. Jamie, honestly, I know Jamie is a very polarizing character. I, I feel for Jamie, I really do. I mean, I, I mean he, he does a lot of awful things. A lot of times he screws up He's definitely not in his masculine energy, but when you when you really look at his story and the things that he's been through and the way that his family treats him, there's moments where I'm like, yeah, of course he's wounded. Like, of course he's screwed up. Like, of course he has no clue what to do. So you find out that he's not actually John Dutton's son. And he essentially was adopted as a baby and was raised as his own, but he was always a little bit different. It's really clear that John Dutton, the patriarch of the family, has really treated Jamie differently than he has everybody else. And then he's upset that Jamie's different than everybody else, which is, Jamie's also a middle child as far as like the, the boys go. He's really like the middle son. Middle children naturally kind of, usually end up kind of being the black sheep of the family. But Jamie clearly has a, a higher intelligence. He's much smarter as far as education did better in school than some of the other kids. So basically, you know, his father essentially was like, well, you're going to Harvard and like sent him off to Harvard, sent him off to law school, was like, I need a lawyer. I'm gonna train you to be a lawyer. Like almost as if Jamie wasn't even actually a son. He was like an employee he was training from birth kind of thing, right? Like, I mean that, you can kind of see where that kind of coldness would cause someone to have a lot of wounding as they grow. And yes, Jamie got all these opportunities. He became a lawyer in the scenes where he's actually doing his thing, like legal wise. I mean, the guy is, you know, he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's like rapid fire. He's really great at negotiations. He he knows his stuff. Like he's a really amazing lawyer. That said, he he struggles so much in really connecting with people, in really actually feeling his place in the world, which probably comes from being treated differently than everybody else. And you know, him and Casey actually have a really good brotherhood. They don't always see eye to eye and they don't always they're not always on the same page, but there is that devotion to each other as like we're brothers like blood or not we're brothers jamie's relationship with beth who is the only daughter of the dunn family is really really toxic and they do get into the kind of the root of the reason why their relationship is toxic which is a really twisted storyline that i have to be totally honest with you does not make a ton of sense to me because i feel like there's a lot of holes in that storyline i'm not going to get into that in this video because I, I feel like that's a really complicated thing that you can google it if you really want to know the reasons why jamie and beth don't get along it opens up a whole other can of worms that i'm not going to get into but essentially when beth was a teenager she got in trouble and she went to jamie for help now jamie was still a teenager himself so they're still like just kids who are trying to figure out this big problem jamie makes some arguably bad decisions in helping her however he was doing what he thought he needed to do at the time and he thought what he was doing was in her best interest at the time 
was it the right decision and was it the wrong decision? I'm not here to start making any kind of judgments about any of those things. However, and I'll get into Beth in a minute, but Beth really does blame Jamie for everything that she feels. And Beth is a really, really, really wounded character. And she really puts all of her wounding and her blame and her punishment onto Jamie. So Jamie really is massively abused by his sister. His father definitely treats him differently. At least the man who he believes to be his father treats him very differently. So Jamie just carries all of this wounding. He's in a very feminine wounding in the sense that he desperately needs people to like and approve of him. As much as he has a lot of intelligence, he can negotiate, I mean, he's really skilled at what he does, he's great at what he does. However, he doesn't have the ability to, to make his own decision, to make his own choices. He's literally at the mercy of everybody else. He's in his own victimhood mode. It's an interesting scene that I, I would love to use as an example, but I know it's gonna get removed for violence. Him and Beth are at each other and Beth starts hitting him. And she's like, come on, be a man, be a man, be a man. And come on, be a man. She's literally beating him senseless. He gets up and punches her and was like, how's that for a man? And she was like, a real man would have walked away. And I have a whole video about women hitting men and the idea of the feminine testing and things like that. I'm not justifying this as, you know, being acceptable as far as the violence or anything. What I'm saying is, is that there's that aspect of it where Beth was like, I want you to show me that you're a man like all these other men. And Beth was acting like a man. I mean, Beth's got her own issues, so I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But the fact that he, he got in his emotions and hit her back, that was displaying his weakness, right? Like that was, because he's not fully stepped into his masculine energy. The thing is, is that I don't think that Jamie necessarily is a bad person. He just needs people to like him. And there are occasions where his need for people to like him does come in handy. In fact, when his father basically decides that he's gonna have him be a ranch hand and like actually start from the bottom and like learn how to work on the ranch because he wasn't really doing that when he was younger because he was learning to become a lawyer, and he really fits in with the guys at the bunkhouse. Like he's in a much more successful financial situation than these guys. He has all the benefits in the world, but he really does become one of them. Like he really does sink in. They're actually like gambling together in one scene. And you know, he has a hand where he's about to take all their money. And he kind of like essentially says he's lost the hand. Like he kind of folds when he could have won. He could have taken all their money because he didn't need the money, but he wanted them to like him more. And in that situation, he was kind of being a good guy. Like he was just like, hey, I'd rather you guys like me than me make some money off of you guys when I know I have way more than, than you do. I don't need it, but you do kind of thing. He's not in his ego all the time. And I, and I, and Jamie has moments where he's in his ego. And it's interesting how Beth always talks about Jamie's being so selfish. There is a sense of selfishness in the fact that he wants everybody to like him, but he's selfless in the idea that he he sacrifices himself and what he wants all the time for his family. And when he actually like snaps and says, okay, I wanna do something for myself now, he gets so much anger and resentment, he ends up doing some things that are quite questionable. I mean, the guy's hands are not clean completely. He does a lot of really sketchy things. However, it's to deal with the fact that he he's not getting the same love and support from his family that the other kids are getting. So like, I'm not justifying some of the things that he's done, because some of the things he's done are horrific. That said, you can see where that path that he was on would get him to where he was. Now, Jamie has a lot of healing he needs to do on himself and actually being able to step into his healthy masculine energy. But he does have a lot of masculine stability. Like when you put him in a courtroom or in a negotiation room, he is focused. He is, you know, when you put him uh, in a, a, a situation where he's campaigning or in office or what, like he gets the job done and he's very creative about how he gets the job done. He knows who to talk to, like he knows what to do. Like he has a lot of great masculine qualities. It's just in his personal life and his personal interactions, he has so much of a need to, for people to like him. It often leads him down the wrong path because he hasn't actually stepped into his ability to just stand in his own and stand in his truth. He hasn't really been allowed that time to do that. I do think, again, in his, in his business life, I think he's got a lot of great masculine qualities. His personal life, he needs to be able to stand on his own more and he has a lot of this sort of victimhood, feminine wounding that he needs to work through in order to get him to the place where he can actually be in his masculine energy overall. Beth frickin' Dutton, I, oh my God, Beth. Oh my God, Beth. Beth is 
<laughs> one of the most wounded characters. Oh my god. Oh my god. Beth has so many issues. And in the same way as Jamie, I see why she ended up so wounded. I mean, you kind of, you see the backstory, like, you see the complexities in her. Beth is a combination of being so wounded masculine. I mean, she is so much in her wounded masculine. I mean, she's literally, like, out to destroy people. Like, she wants to ruin people's lives. She's so in that wounded masculine destructive wanting to be she's abusive downright in some circumstances and she's so much in her wounded feminine of like addictions and just self-harm and chaos there's actually an interesting storyline you see some backstory about beth and and some glimpses into her childhood and there's actually a scene where beth gets her first period and her mother it's interesting because it's always been alluded to that beth had this really really awful relationship with her mom that her mom treated her so badly there's a scene where beth gets her first period and her mother is obviously like so loving and nurturing as if like that's how her mother had been to her up to that point until she got her period and then her mother is basically like she runs her bath to ease her cramps like she's she's talking to her and she's soothing her she's so warm and nurturing with beth but she's explaining to Beth about how now that Beth has become a woman, that men are going to think that they can take advantage of her and that Beth is going to need to toughen up and that as a mother, she was going to have to be really mean to Beth in order to toughen her up and that her mother had done that to her and it was the best gift she ever gave her, but that Beth was essentially going to end up hating her mother, which is really exactly what happened. I don't agree with that. I, I really don't. And I understand that to a certain extent, Beth was going to have a rough life because, again, she was the only girl in a family of men and they were basically going to spend their entire lives fighting for this land that everyone was trying to take. So I understand that there was a point to it. However, it's not a mother's role to toughen up her daughters. Like, it was literally like her mother was essentially... She was essentially like like giving Beth a masculine shield. I mean, she was essentially trying to turn Beth into this like tough guy. And I don't really think that that's a mother's role. And I understand if you have a single parent home and you're trying to play both roles as the mother and the father, that gets more complicated. But in this situation where you have a mother and you have a father, there's distinct energies and roles that, that the, the masculine father and the feminine mother kind of bring to the relationship. There's actually a podcast that I listened to on this topic that actually summed it up really perfectly. So I'm gonna link the podcast below. So you can take a listen to it. It was actually recommended to me and I watched it. Really, really great podcast where uh, basically a man who talks about masculinity was explaining the benefits of femininity and talking about the value that his wife brings as far as the loving and the nurturing to the family. I think it sums it up really well. So I'm going to leave that in the description box. Highly recommend you check it out. But there's like a loving, nurturing energy that a mother brings to the relationship, to her family relationship, her relationship with her partner, with her child. This idea that that this mother essentially had to like toughen up her daughter and essentially turn her in, I mean, she turned Beth into a bully. I mean, Beth is a major, major bully. Beth is the perfect example of a psychotic woman. Oh my God, she's crazy. So like that scene really bugged me. And and the fact that, that this mother essentially was trying to torture Beth into becoming tougher, I don't really agree with that mentality at all. So Beth obviously has this really twisted relationship with her mother as far as a lot of resentment and anger and a lot of guilt inside of Beth and all these kind of things. Beth's relationship with her father, John Dutton, is really twisted too because she's got this, I mean it's a real, <laughs> it's an odd thing. Like there's there's this kind of like almost like godlike worship devotion of her father and this kind of obsession with with the father and it, it's it's a it's a it's a weird dynamic beth in her business when you see her in business i mean she is like she's ruthless and and it's not just like that she's just like good at her job i mean she makes like i just did a devil wears prada breakdown she makes miranda Priestley look like a kitten and like beth dutton is like a saber-toothed tiger or something like that like it's just it, it, she's just she's she's like out for blood like she's out to destroy people over the course of the show are there times when that toughness and that destruction of people actually you know she's trying to destroy people who deserve it yeah are there times when she's literally just like taking down people as collateral damage or trying to destroy people for her ego's sake or things like that yeah like she's just like a, a a bulldozer that doesn't really care what's in her path when it comes to her career she is devoted to her father she will do anything for her father not for the land or for the property she just doesn't care about the same things that her father cares about she only cares about her father 
and she will do anything to anyone who she thinks might try to hurt him, which is not really a daughter's role to feel like she has to protect and defend her father. That gets into some twisted stuff when the father actually, like, you know, has... The father's single, he has some relationships with some women, and the daughter gets really, really pissed. I mean, there's all kinds of weird Freudian stuff that's going on there, I'm sure. Beth does have some good moments. Like, she does have some good lines. I will give her that. Like, when she tells off the guy in the bar, I think it's, in, I think it's actually in the pilot episode with this guy who's, like, hitting on her, and she's basically, like, she tells him off, and, like, that's a pretty good scene. There's a really great, another bar scene. Beth's a drunk, right? So it's a really good bar scene where she kind of tells a woman whose husband is kind of treating her terribly like that she needs to stand up for herself and the woman does and you know Beth's like okay well took care of what I need to do today she also confronts a woman who you know obviously has been beaten by her husband I think it's in a liquor store it's in some kind of convenience store or something and Beth basically like gives this woman the advice on how to get out of the relationship like Beth does have some redeeming qualities in that she definitely wants to stand up for women who are being mistreated she steps in for Monica and Monica essentially which is a really odd situation like I find the whole like Monica when she was about to get arrested and she calls Beth because she doesn't really know who else to call in that moment Beth really does step in and has Monica's back for sure that whole scene seemed really weird it's like I, I don't know, I, the fact that they were harassing Monica and thought she was shoplifting and that, I, I thought that was, whole thing was a little bit odd, but Beth is willing to step up and do anything that possible to protect, so she's got that masculine quality, although she really does kind of like to destroy people for fun and for her own ego, which is definitely her wounded masculine. Her drinking, her, you know, really irresponsible behavior, very often self-destructive behavior, that's all her wounded feminine energy. Her relationship with Rip. Rip. <laughs> Uh, I, Rip to me is like the most dreamboat worthy of the entire show. Like he's like, yeah. Her relationship with Rip is really complicated. They obviously, I mean, Rip has a really, really twisted story. He was orphaned. He actually doesn't really even exist legally. And he kind of gets abandoned and ends up on this ranch and ends up kind of growing up as a ranch hand. It's essentially John Dutton's like right-hand man. He essentially like looks up to John Dutton as like not even just a father figure but almost as this like again this godlike character. As a result, him and Beth have had this flirtation, sexual relationship, things like that since they were essentially teenagers. So Beth is really his first love. And I would say he's probably Beth's first like real love. It is alluded to a lot that Beth Beth gets around, she sleeps around. It's very much like a Samantha Jones kind of thing. Like, like I kind of feel like Beth is like is like Samantha Jones. I have a breakdown of Sex in the City, but it's it's she's kind of like Samantha Jones in cowboy boots kind of thing. Only a, a more violent and aggressive, right? It's more of a distraction for her and a bit of a self harm kind of activity. This is kind of like sleeping around, like she's disconnected from her body. She's had some gynecological issues, which I'm, I'm not going to delve into in this because that that gets really complicated and everything. But she's disconnected from her feminine body. She's very controlling. You even see in like the flashback scenes of Beth and Rip when they were teenagers. Beth is very, she's very like disconnected from her feelings. She's disassociated from her feelings and she's controlling Rip. She's always the one that has to be in the power and the control in the relationship. And their relationship is really complicated. I don't know if their dynamic would actually ever work in real life. And, and here's why. Because Rip is a very masculine man. He has a lot of direction. He's a lot of drive. He keeps himself very grounded, even in the midst of panic or chaos. Like, he has the direction, he has the purpose, you know, he, he really has a lot of masculine direction. And he has a heart. He has such a beautiful, sensitive heart. He has obviously is a huge soft spot for Beth. You know, he does get emotional sometimes, like at a certain point when John alludes to the fact that he saw Rip as a son. Rip just, he gets really teary-eyed. Like he's got a lot of that really, really healthy masculine feminine balance, which is why he's such a dreamy character. I think his attraction to Beth is probably because again, it's his first love kind of thing. Childhood nostalgia, he's caught up in this. She is the daughter of a man who he really emulates. I mean, there's that kind of dynamic there, but Beth is really not very nice to him. Like she treats him pretty terribly, which could be because of a lot of his childhood trauma that he's attracted to somebody treats him terribly. They don't really dive into that too much, but that could be a part of it. Beth is so guarded. She's so in her masculine. And every time that Rip tries to kind of get sweet and sensitive with her, 
she puts a wall up like they have sex and he's like hey can i take you to a music festival and she's like she's like oh you ruin it every time and and it's just then she starts insulting him like it's you know he gets frustrated and then you know he he kind of avoids her he walks away from her doesn't want to have anything to do with her later on and she's like you know oh, pick something that's more more me you know picks up like she's like telling him what to do and she says later on they're up on the roof and they're having this really great discussion she's like i want a date i want you to take me on a date i want to like she's literally telling him what to do i mean he's kind of like playfully amused by it i think he's amused by her when she's in her masculine he's frustrated sometimes he's amused but he because she's constantly changing he he kind of it's a fascination for him. I think there's something to the fact that he is a cowboy and he's used to like herding cattle, herding bulls, herding these wild animals. He's used to being out in nature, out on this, on the land dealing with animals. And the fact that Beth is kind of an animal that needs taming, so to speak. I mean, I'm not talking about this in like a, he's trying to control her kind of way. Cause I don't think anybody can really control Beth, but there is that Thing that's drawing him to her like she's she's chaotic like nature and he really is a country boy so there's this idea of him really being drawn to that that chaos he gets repelled when she puts that wall up like he's like i don't want to deal with you anymore i don't have time for you today when she softens he's much more drawn to her like there's that there's that magnetism and you see it with the two of them when she actually does let herself relax into her feminine they come together. And that's really, it's beautiful to see. There's a really great scene where he makes her breakfast and she's like, well, you're not gonna have breakfast. And he's like, why well, I ate breakfast hours ago. I just wanna watch you and eat. He, he literally is giving to her because he wants to watch her and witness her enjoy receiving something that he's given her. It's literally masculine energy. It's the masculine giving energy. And his pleasure and joy is in watching the feminine receive pleasure from what he has done for her. She kind of is, is covered up at first. Like she's kind of blocking, like she doesn't really want to be seen. And he kind of like takes her hand and kind of like puts it down and is like, and, and when she really fully feels him seeing her, like that's her feminine coming out. Like she's had this wall up with him. She is letting her feminine feel feel being seen and he is fully seeing and witnessing her she starts to cry it's a really rare moment that beth will show vulnerability but it's that moment that she sinks into that vulnerability that is them being polarized that's him and his masculine giving and witnessing her and the feminine is receiving that pleasure and actually feeling him being seen she was really blocked to that she was really afraid to be seen fully she was afraid to be seen in that feminine energy in that moment that he fully sees her that's the moment that they that they have this oh it's such a beautiful moment i just it that moments like that are really beautiful there's also a scene which i know i can't use because it's way too violent beth is basically under attack she's being beaten and she thinks she's going to be killed she thinks she might be sexually assaulted she texts rip essentially like i'm in my office help like beth usually can handle herself like she wants to take care of things herself like she's in her in her masculine i'm in charge i'm the boss rip is the person that she will go to that she trusts to help her so when she needs help that's the man it's usually how you know the feminine actually wants a masculine in her life or really trusts a masculine partner if he's the one that she goes to when she needs help she which i, I don't know if the strategy is good or not in in self-defense terms anyone out there who knows more about self-defense can probably give more of a backup but she is essentially like putting this guy down this guy's attacking her you're not really sure if he's going to sexually assault her or not and she's literally like yelling at him like she is in her she is as masculine and aggressive as she possibly can be with this guy who's essentially beaten the crap out of her and she's showing her dominance one of the guys ends up shooting her assistant right in front of her like it's this it's absolutely traumatic moment where she's got this aggression rip comes in and he literally saves the day like he's the he's the hero that comes in and actually saves the day and she sinks into him it's that moment like she won't show weakness with this guy who's beating her and attacking her she refuses to show weakness until rip comes and takes care of the situation and it's in that moment in his presence only that she's willing to cry and show weakness and that's the moment because in another moment, Beth feels like Rip's about to say, I love you. And Beth is like, no, 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 don't say it now. It doesn't count now because it was a romantic moment. She's like, tell me sometime when it saves me. And in that moment when she's literally like collapsing into him because she feels so broken because she's had this wall up that was so up 
that it was exhausting her. It was in that moment that he says, I love you, because he knows that's the moment it's gonna save her. That's the moment she needs to hear it. It's, it's indications like that that she's willing to put her guard down for him, but she still runs the show a lot of the time. I do think to some extent, because Rip has to be in so much of his masculine energy for what he does in his day-to-day -day life, for his work, for everything. To some extent, because Beth takes over control in their relationship, he can kind of lean back more and it does give him the opportunity to not constantly have to be in his masculine. It's hard to know if that's something that would be sustainable because Beth has so much wounding. Rip should have a lot of wounding. He should have a lot more wounding, but in reality, he's actually pretty grounded and pretty stable as far as his masculine and his connection to his feminine. Beth is so wounded. It's hard to really know what dynamic is really gonna work for them in the long term because she's gonna need to heal that stuff in order for her to be able to have a stable and loving relationship with someone. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see where their relationship goes. I know they kind of have like a, a boy that they've kind of adopted. Beth kind of like found him and brought him into the ranch and Beth and Rip had very different ideas about how this boy should be treated. And I think Rip th thought that this boy needed kind of to be like Jimmy in a sense where he needed all masculine energy and to be initiated into his masculinity whereas Beth kind of wanted to mother him but from a controlling sense and the minute that it got difficult Beth was like I don't want to do this anymore it, like Beth can't become a mother is the storyline and so she kind of takes on this this boy she's adopted and wants to kind of mother him but doesn't really know how to mother and she doesn't really know how to be that loving nurturing mother she didn't have a mother who was loving and nurturing for her through most of her like preteen and teen years she's been so in her masculine it'd be interesting to see where it goes with that i think that this boy carter is i think is his name when you have a a, a child someone who's still a child who's growing up he only has masculine energy and masculine influence and he doesn't get that nurturing feminine energy that can be a problem in the same way as if he only got the loving nurturing energy and he never got any of that masculine direction or masculine guidance that's a problem so the fact that he's not really getting any feminine energy from from a parental figure and he's only getting all of this kind of like masculine energy i don't know it'll be interesting to see how that goes john dutton is the patriarch of the family he is very masculine although some of it does come from ego and some of it does come from stubbornness he does have a couple different flings with a couple different women that kind of go on but he does seem very respectful of these women he hasn't really settled down he's he's widowed so he's kind of you can tell he's kind of still dealing with that he deals with that at one point like the anniversary of his of his wife's death with fooling around with one of his girlfriends um who is is like the mayor i think she is or she's a big politician she's a governor she's, she's a politician essentially and they kind of have this like friends with benefits type situation she's a widow as well so it's kind of like the two of them come together to support each other and it's interesting at one point like they're gonna have have sex and she kind of can't because she's in her emotions and he's very respectful of that lets her talk lets her i mean he, he's he's, a, he's a, a good overall guy. I do think that some of his moves and the things that he makes do come from ego. He has a little bit of trouble actually with his, with his inner feminine side as far as actually showing love and compassion to the people who he really should be showing it to. Like that he really doesn't really know how to show any love and compassion to Jamie for sure. He does have a little bit of blockage with his own inner feminine energy. Losing your wife and, and stuff can be really difficult because that can leave a real like hole in you if his wife was the feminine energy in their relationship and stuff. So, you know, I mean, he's been through a lot. He struggles a lot. He really has to put like a guard up to protect himself, his land, his family. I mean, he's, he's really a target for a lot of different people. So not really great at actually taking care of his health, actually. He's pretty stubborn and stuff. He's kind of like the, the, the character that everybody else, like things happen around him. He's almost like part of the land. Like the land is kind of, is him and everything that happens around him is kind of all part of the land is the way I would put it. So a lot of other characters in the show, I, I really can't break down all of them, but I just want to give an overview of some of these characters and some of the lessons that I picked up from watching the show. So I will do my best to try to find some little clips of the show, whatever scenes that I can find that I think that social media won't be too upset about, and try to put them on my TikTok and some YouTube shorts so you can see some of these energies like in action. And again, if you have watched the show or you do watch the show or anything, let me know. I'd love to hear, you know, what you think of 
my analysis or what any of your thoughts about some of the aspects of the show. Maybe some of the characters I didn't cover in this because, you know, this video can only be so long. I'm sure it's already pretty long as it is. So yeah, if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please give it a big thumbs up and be sure you subscribe to my channel. If you have any thoughts on this show or any film recommendations or anything like that, let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you and I love your suggestions. If you want to learn to connect to your feminine energy, I have online courses. Details in the description box below along with links to all my social media accounts. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you join me next time.